Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where we are reading the book In His Hand, written by Sophie Beres and Arpad Shu, describing the story of Arpad's life, a young Romanian SDA pastor in the times of the former Soviet Union. In our last reading, we covered chapters 5 through 7, where we learned of Arpad's acceptance into the SDA seminary, the difficulty he had when he was falsely accused by the family of a girl who had wanted to be his girlfriend three years prior, and even though all who were at the event confirmed that he had done nothing wrong, he ended up having to leave the seminary for two years. Nonetheless, he poured himself into working with his father in his district, and when he returned to seminary, he excelled. It was during his seminary years that he began smuggling SDA literature, first with Sabbath school lessons, then Steps to Christ, The Desire of Ages, and finally, complete songbooks with music, all of which were banned in Romania. He developed a very sophisticated, successful strategy and soon, the literary contraband was spreading all across Romania. One day, as he and two of his seminary friends were transporting a load of books to the hometown of one of his friends, they were stopped by the police. The penalty for smuggling books could be up to 25 years. The policeman had them open the trunk of the car and began to pull the smuggled books out and pile them up on the street. That was it. Surely, they would all be arrested, and that would be the end of seminary, their careers as pastors, and their lives. Prison was inevitable. Arpad and his friends prayed earnestly. We pick up the story on that street corner, with the policeman tossing the books onto the street, with chapter 8, entitled, Hungry People. This is it. Arpad prayed, his heart in his throat. Unless you save us, please send a distraction, he pleaded. He leaned back in his seat and waited. Vroom! A black Volga, a large Russian car, the largest made during the 70s, roared through the red light at the intersection just a few feet away. The oncoming lanes of cars screeched to a stop, some swerving in the intersection to miss the speeder and the honking began. The police officer looked up, cursed, threw the license and registration into the trunk, ran to the police car, jumped in and started the siren and took off following the Volga. Arpad leaped out of the car and joined Mihai and they dropped to their knees right there on the pavement. Thank you, Lord, they prayed, their hearts flooding with praise. Arpad felt light-headed with joy. Then they threw the books back into the trunk and sped off, so that if the cop decided to come back, they would be long gone. They made it safely to Bacau, dropped off the rest of the car load, and went to Mihai's home. Because they had to be back to their assigned churches for the weekend, they couldn't stay the night, and it was a six-hour drive back to the school. Arpa decided to call his own home from there, and when he did, he learned that his four-year-old niece had died of complications she had had since birth. I'll be right there, Arpa had said. He called to the seminary, leaving only a message that he wouldn't be there for his responsibilities that Sabbath. 
and then he left for the funeral in Turgumurez. He returned to the campus late Sunday night. On Monday morning, Elder Popa called him in to report about his absence. You know you're not supposed to leave without permission, the president said. Your family called here on Friday to tell you that your niece had passed away, but we couldn't find you anywhere. You did not originally leave to go to the funeral. Let's go outside. Arpad knew that Elder Popa's office was bugged. Tell me, what's really going on? Elder Popa asked. Arpad had to confess. He didn't want to lie to his director. I took a load of literature up to Bakau, Arpad said. A load of literature? Elder Popa's eyebrows shot straight up. He groaned. Arpad, what have you gotten into? Arpad told the president everything. I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate it so much, Elder Popa said after Arpad told him. Both of them shed some tears. I knew it all along. I didn't want to know, though. Arpad knew that he could easily be expelled for this. It was hard to educate pastors and then allow them to take risks that could put them in jail where they wouldn't be useful. Arpad wondered if he would be sent home again. Instead, he was required to write several long papers as serious punishment, but he was allowed to stay and finish his studies. We hope this doesn't happen again, Elder Popa said. I don't want to lose you to prison. In spite of this warning, Arpa took his chances. He continued leading the smuggling work for the remainder of his time at the seminary, for it was now in his blood. Once, he was carrying a bag of expensive books, so heavy that it was hard to carry, when he noticed that somebody was following him. The man in the fur hat looked away every time Arpad looked at him, avoiding eye contact. Arpad crossed the street, ducked down an alley, and into another street. The man was still there, following. Arpad turned sharply and ducked into the entrance of a 15-story apartment complex. As he turned the corner, he dropped the heavy bag under a bottom step in the stairwell and bolted to the opposite side of the building, ran out another door, and then ran to another apartment entrance beside it. He ran up and down floors until he found a corner of yet another apartment in which to hide for a while. As soon as he was safe, he called Jacob to go pick up the bag. Less than half an hour from the time he left it, his friend came and found it gone. Only the government would dare to haul away that heavy illegal bag, Arpad thought. No one else would claim it. Another time, Arpad was riding a moped with a box of 50 books strapped in a box on the back. While crossing an intersection, he crashed into a car that had pulled out in front of him. Half of his books spilled out. His elbows and knees bloodied. Arpad knew he was badly hurt, but he had to do something about the books fast. Passers-by were picking up the books and returning them to him. Take it. Take it, he told them, refusing to receive them back. Keep it. The traffic police came. Are you okay, they asked. Fine, fine, Arpad insisted. He scooped up all his stuff and pushed his bike to the side of the intersection. Traffic cops weren't as concerned about these kinds of books as the security forces were, but their eyes were always open because of their training. 
he had lost half his books, but again had avoided capture. Food was scarce at that time, and all Romanian citizens were given food coupons. One household could buy only two pounds of sugar a month or two pounds of flour. It was illegal to store food in the home. The militia would come and search people's homes. And if people had more food than had been rationed out to them, they would either get fined or sent to jail, depending on how much food they had. Since supplies would run down in some villages, sometimes people went to other towns to buy sugar, flour, or oil. The police always eyed anything that was heavy. Guards at the train station looked especially at large suitcases going onto the train. Arpad was taking a heavy suitcase of literature on the train, but he needed two people to lift it. What are you carrying there? the guard asked. Arpad knew that even if he said illegal religious literature, the guard wouldn't believe him. He would have to open the suitcase. Look, Arpad said, I'll give you fifty dollars if you let us go. We have so many hungry people in this village that we're just trying to feed them. Please let us go. Spiritual food, Arpad thought, but did not tell him. Where is the money? The guard said, looking around. Fifty dollars was a huge amount of money in Romania. Arpad slipped the folded bills to him, and the guard slipped the money into his pocket. Then he helped Arpad lift the suitcase onto the train. Not everyone was so lucky. Government agents would search people's homes, and if they found any book printed before 1949, they would confiscate it. Many times, church members would pay a hundred dollars for a book, the equivalent of a year's salary, and then two weeks later, there would be a search, and it would be taken. Then, two people from Arpad's chain were caught. They had been trained not to lead the interrogators to the exact source, and rather than give out the information of the source, they decided to go to jail. Since the government could tell they weren't the origin of the smuggling, one was sentenced to two years of prison, and the other got three. Arpad knew that if he got caught, there would be a lot of charges against him. He would receive up to a 25-year sentence. After a few years in seminary, Arpad married Ildiko, his high school sweetheart. Later, after he graduated, he was given five little churches in Romanian villages to pastor. He and his wife had two sons. For four more years, he continued leading the ring of smugglers. But he didn't let the illegal activities stop with books. The end of chapter 8. Chapter 9. The Message the Trabant, a small East German car, sputtered out and choked and fizzled out of energy right in the middle of the road. We're out of gas, Arpad groaned to the visiting pastor. And we had only 11 miles to go. Gas was rare in Romania, and the city of Cluj-Napoca, from which they had started that afternoon, had been completely out of gas, but they had to risk the 70-mile drive. The visiting pastor from the conference was scheduled to officiate at a joint evangelistic meeting and communion service at one of Arpad's churches in Simleul Silvanei. Oh no, the pastor exclaimed. We have to make it in time for the communion service this evening. What shall we do? I don't see any houses around here. He looked out the rolled-down window at the cropland around them. 
Should we try to flag down a ride? I guess that's the only way we can get there, Arpad said, sighing. The hot afternoon sun shimmered on the worn road in front of them. Let's push the car to the side and wait for someone to come. A few cars sped by them during the next hour and a half. But though Arpad stood in front of the road and waved, they didn't slow down. He had to jump out of the way each time. Shall we walk? He asked the pastor finally. We can't walk 11 miles in the time we need to, but maybe we can find a house somewhere over the next hill. We can see if we can buy gas from them. Arpad took a plastic jug from the car and they started walking. While they walked, Arpad pondered their predicament. The communist government forbade evangelistic meetings, proselytizing, baptism, constructing churches and children's meetings, anything designed to further the growth of a church regardless of the religion. Because these activities were prohibited, their value escalated in the sight of the church. In spite of the suppression, Christianity was flourishing. Church members risked their freedom to invite acquaintances to evangelistic meetings. There was always the chance that someone would report suspicious church activities to the government in exchange for an extra gallon of milk a month. Some of the informers were church members themselves. People could trust only those they knew well. Communion, usually held once every 13 weeks, was a special service of foot washing, grape juice, and unleavened bread. Commemorating the Last Supper, Jesus' example of humility and his ultimate sacrifice. In Romania, this sacred service was such a privileged and meaningful time that most Adventists would miss this only on their deathbeds. All those people will be waiting, Arpad thought. We can't let them down. At the top of a small rise, they saw a farmhouse about a half mile away. When they reached the house, they walked up the porch steps and knocked on the door. An old man opened the door very suspicious. What do you want? he asked. Will you help us? Arpad asked. Our car ran out of gas about a mile back, and we're desperate to make it to the next town. Do you have any gas we can buy, even a little bit? The man shook his head. No, I don't have any, he said. He looked at the sweating men. But there's plenty of water in our well. Take some. Thank you, Harpert said. The man shut the door. Well, I am thirsty, the pastor said. But water is not going to help us get there. Harpert and the pastor went around the house to the backyard where the well stood. They lowered the cable and pulled up a brimming bucket. They each took a drink, and Arpad poured two liters of water into his jug. What are you going to do with that? the pastor asked. I don't know, Arpad replied. Maybe I'll pour it in the tank. What? And ruin the car? the pastor exclaimed. That's ridiculous. They started the long mile back. Water's not going to work, Arpad. It will ruin the engine. Don't you know anything? We'll have to wait for another car. Someone will have to stop eventually. Arpad raised his eyebrows. Out here? Now that it's closer to dusk? I don't think anyone will stop now. Especially since they didn't earlier. When they reached the car, Arpad unscrewed the gas cap. Please, Lord, he prayed, provide a way for us to get there. He took the jug and slowly poured the two liters into the fuel tank. 
That's so stupid, Arpad, the pastor said. Now we are really in trouble. Let's get in the car, Arpad said. He jumped in and turned the key. The engine turned and it started up without a fuss. The pastor was silent and his eyes widened in amazement. Let's go, Arpad said smiling. The Lord is with us. They made it the remaining 11 miles on water, just in time for the service. On Monday, Arpad had the car towed to the shop to have it fixed. The water should have damaged it. It's sure strange, the mechanic told Arpad. But the water didn't ruin the engine at all. You're lucky. Arpad praised the Lord. In all his travels to the surrounding churches, Arpad noticed the need for children's Sabbath school materials. Children must stay with their parents through every meeting. The government rule insisted. But still the churches found a way to sneak a Sabbath school class just for the little ones. The children need color pictures, Arpad thought. It's hard for them to visualize the Bible stories and pictures would help. How can we get some? Printing Bible story pictures was also illegal, as were almost all of Arpad's schemes. He had made friends with the diplomats at the American Embassy in Bucharest. Arpad soon trusted this Adventist couple and told them about his smuggling and the need for Bible story material to teach the children. They were so supportive that they supplied him with a set of the Bible story books by Arthur Maxwell and also a book with colored prints on Ellen White's life. Portraits, birthplace, visions, prophecies, and diagrams of prophetic time. Arthur photographed the vivid pictures, mounted them in handmade plastic frames, and sold them to the churches. Setting up this business was equally risky. Arthur had a fake passport developed so that he could travel to East Germany to buy the photographic equipment. Except for trips to other communist countries every two years, the Romanian government forbade citizens to travel. When people applied for a passport, they gave the passport agency their identification cards, and when the travelers returned, they exchanged their passport for their Romanian ID card. But Arpad had found a way around this with a fake passport. Because he had a system with which he could make four times as many prints as the other underground developers made, Arpad sold the prints more cheaply than his competitors and learned to be efficient in the developing process. With this money he earned from selling slides, he bought a car, a white Dacia, that would help him travel from church to church. The church buildings in Arpad's district were old and falling apart. Because the government would not give permission for fixing the buildings or constructing new churches, the conference couldn't give the church any money for repairs. Arpad had to find creative ways to get the job done. Once he worked with his members in one village, to build a large family home. When the house was finished, the members tore down the specially designed walls inside to make room for a large church. In another village, a small church made out of clay was breaking into pieces. Each Sabbath, the roof crumbled more and more, and in some places, it was caving in. Obviously, it was no longer safe. Arpad orchestrated a plan 
sending his church members out at night to dig a wide trench around the building and pour a cement foundation around the dying church. Before morning, they covered it back up again, leaving no trace that there had been any work done. A few days later, the workers returned at night and with their headlamps and lights, the bricks started coming, brought by church members from every direction by every means. The bricks came by horse carts, cows, oxen, donkeys, horses, pickup trucks, and cars. From everywhere, the church members had separately bought and stored them. A group of 80 people uncovered the foundation, built the walls, and installed a pre-made roof with the trusses attached. The new church, quickly built without windows, was much larger, swallowing the old one inside it. By sunrise, it was finished. Someone reported the new building to the government, and soon several bulldozers roared up to the site. Arpad wasn't there, but his church members wouldn't give up without a fight. Move out of our way, the bulldozer's drivers ordered. The church members didn't answer him, but they moved into a solid ring about the building and refused to budge. If it goes, we go, their bodies announced. Although they were exhausted from their all-night labor, they wouldn't leave their work to be destroyed. For three days, they made a human barricade around their new church. Finally, the bulldozers left. The members went inside and tore the old church out. The very next Sabbath, joyful songs poured from the doorway in the church without windows. The building stands to this day. The government did arrest Arpad, however, and beat him severely. But he rejoiced that his members were getting their needs met. During this time, the literature smuggling business was going well. The chain of smugglers knew the system and the delivery of materials was secure. Everything was working smoothly and there were two connections in the print shop now. The first was still working for the communist army print shop and the second was in the print shop inside the communist party's headquarters. Arpad traveled every week to a new church. He preached four sermons every weekend. He always carried extra bread from a bakery to give to those in each church who had little to eat. Though buying extra food was illegal, Arpad had developed an underground connection with the bakeries in his village. He spent his Sundays visiting his members, counseling them, and giving them Bible studies. Then he returned to his home on Sunday night. One Sabbath, he was out in a district church a long distance from home when a local church member handed him a scrawled message taken through the only phone in the village. Arpad, my husband Bila was arrested with the books it read. He was forced to turn in your name. I didn't tell your wife. That was all. And that was all Arpad needed to hear. His mind reeled, his thoughts tumbling faster than he could keep up with them. His friend Blela Blensesi was caught. There were 10,000 of those songbooks that he was smuggling. Arpad remembered. It was proven that they had come from Arpad. He shuddered at the abuse he knew his friend must have been receiving. Because Bella had identified Arpad as the ringleader of the smugglers, Bella would be punished with a lighter sentence. He couldn't blame his friend. Bella's wife must have called Arpad's home to find out where he was in order to reach him. Bless her heart, Arpad thought. She wouldn't have told his wife because she knew lines were tapped. 
Arpad remembered when he had come home at an unusual time once and had seen government secret agents break into his home and leave again with nothing apparently touched. Communists were not supposed to break into homes when the owners were gone, but they made the rules and they always broke them. Arpad had realized that if he were to complain to the government of the break-in, he would be murdered in a car wreck the next day. If people crossed the government, they were often killed accidentally in car accidents. His thoughts continued to leap over each other. I can't go back home or tell my wife. They will be waiting for me. The smuggling years were over. If he didn't escape now, his freedom was over. I knew this might happen, but I never knew when. He said goodbye to his church members, jumped into his dakia, and with only the clothes he had on his body and his fake passport, sped off into the distance. And that night, Arpa's wife waited huddled with her two sons on the sofa. The boys watched her face that was clouded with fear. Where's Papa? Three-year-old Norby lisped, confused. Their mother shook her head, trying to hold back tears. He'll be here soon, she said, believing that the unsuspecting Arpad would soon return. Waiting at her table, sat the police. Arpad never showed up. The end of chapter 9. Chapter 10. The Double Compartment. I'm glad I have my fake passport, Arpad thought, as he drove up to the Hungarian border patrol station. It's so hard to get these that they probably won't suspect me. It's also stamped with visas from all my trips to East Germany for film. That will be another reason for them to not suspect me. He remembered the time he had been strip searched. No worries about that now. He had nothing with him but the clothes on his back. Another time, his car was completely dismantled by the border police who were looking for dollars or of any kind of foreign currency. He had to put all the parts back together himself before he could go on. But this time, he passed the border patrol without incident. I have to get my wife out of Romania, Arpad thought worriedly as he drove on. Now that I have escaped, they'll be watching her very closely. She won't be able to apply for a passport in our country. She'll have to apply for a Hungarian tourist visa in her hometown. None of the towns had their information on computers, so she wouldn't get caught if she acted quickly. She must get out of Romania right away. She'll need to leave the boys with her parents, he thought, his brain working quickly. Then when she comes across to Hungary, I'll meet up with her. From there... I will come up with a plan to smuggle her into Austria. We'll ask for political asylum, and the boys will have to be released to us. We'll be together again, and free. The thought exhilarated him. When Arpad passed over the Austrian border, he breathed a sigh of relief. He called a friend, Lacey, who lived in Austria, and with whom he hadn't spoken in years and relayed the plan through him to Ildiko. But how would he get her from Hungary to Austria? The question plagued him. And then he found the perfect solution. Lacey showed him a gray and blue 1969 Volkswagen van. The van was ordinary in every respect, with an engine compartment in the back. Hey! Harpard thought. If I move the seat that sits in front of the engine compartment and expand the area into a double compartment, a person could squeeze into that spot. If we build the wall carefully, no one will know the difference. 
That's how I can smuggle my wife to Austria. The plan struck him as brilliant. He and his friend worked long and hard to construct the little access area in front of the engine. Inside the compartment, he wired a light hooked to a control switch on the dashboard. He could then send messages to her. One flash would mean, don't move. Two flashes would mean, emergency, I'll get you out of there. The ventilator that drew hot air from the engine to the cabin was converted into a fan to supply fresh air to the double compartment. He moved the wall out further and replaced the seat so that it was a little closer to the front seat that it faced. Over the double compartment fit the luggage and with the nice paint job and skilled work, no one could tell that the van had anything but an ordinary engine compartment in it. Although Arpa knew this was still a huge risk, he couldn't wait to see if it worked. Of course it will, he thought. On his way back to Hungary to pick up his wife, he filled the double compartment with religious contraband to take into Hungary. Since Austria was a free nation, there were plenty of books piled up waiting to be smuggled over into the communist countries by anyone who had the means. Though he was still running from the communists, Arpad took a load to drop off. It was in his blood and he couldn't resist. The mission was successful. When Ildiko arrived in Budapest, the bustling capital of Hungary, he was ready to smuggle her out. The morning before they left, Arpad bought a newspaper. He opened the paper and instantly froze. There, on the front, a huge picture spread across the black and white page. It was a Volkswagen van. It looked exactly like his own. The headline said, Man arrested for smuggling double compartment van. Arpad's hands shook. Ildiko, look at this, he cried. Look at this. You've got to be kidding, she gasped. That could be us. What are we going to do? Fear descended on both of them. We'll have to change our plan, Arpad stammered. I had no idea this was a popular idea. I won't be able to smuggle you into Austria the way we planned. That will be way too risky. Then what will we do? She asked, worry large and restless in her eyes. Arpad thought hard for a moment. Switch to plan B. Plan B? What's that? We'll get you a fake visa and you'll fly to Belgrade, Yugoslavia, Arpad said. I'll have my pastor friend, Sandor Zalzma, from nearby Novi Sad, pick you up from the airport. I'll cross to Yugoslavia and meet you there, then smuggle you into Austria. But Arpad, Ildiko said, isn't there another way? Do I have to get a fake visa? What if they catch me? That's our best choice right now. We'll have to go with it. Oh, wailed Ildiko. I'm so scared. Everything is going to be fine. Arpad reassured her. Really? He hugged her. Although he could see Ildiko was terrified, Arpad admired his wife for the courage she was showing. She swallowed her fear and agreed to go along with his plan so they wouldn't have to be separated. I hope I don't let her down, Arpad thought, but I can't think of another way. He called some old acquaintances in the town who had connections and bought a fake visa. Then he called his friend in Novi Sad and finally bought his wife a ticket to Belgrade. 
At the airport, they watched the plane come in. She gripped his hand. Are you sure this will work? What if I never see you again? She whispered. What if they catch you? What will I do if they catch me? I'm so scared. They won't, Arpad assured her. Your visa looks authentic. Trust me, everything will be fine. They went to the ticket counter, and everything did go well. They walked to the gate together and waited for the boarding call. Arpad hugged his wife goodbye. I'll see you in Belgrade, he said, smiling. It won't be long. Soon we'll be free. She smiled, brushing away a tear, and waved. Then she turned and boarded the shuttle bus to the plane, her head held high. With the ache in his throat that he always got when he parted from his wife, Arpad climbed to the observation deck on the upper floor and watched the bus grow smaller. He waited till the plane taxied down the airstrip and flew off, a disappearing speck above the trees. His wife's plane would reach Belgrade in one hour. Arpad left the airport in his van and started driving toward Belgrade. A few hours later, he was halfway to his destination, not yet at the border of Yugoslavia. He went to a payphone and called his friend Sandor, who had agreed to pick up his wife at the airport upon her arrival. Did the plane come in on time? Arpad asked Sandor. Yes, his friend replied, sounding worried. But your wife wasn't on it. She was on the passenger list. But she never boarded the plane. Are you sure she didn't miss her flight? What? I watched her get on the airport bus. I watched the plane take off. Oh no. The truth hit, punching him hard, sending his emotions reeling. I don't think she ever got on that plane, his friend insisted. You might want to check back at the airport. Maybe they will put her on a different flight. Arpad pushed the panic down that was rising in his throat. Thanks for your help, Sandor, he said, as he hung up. I'll let you know what I find out. He paced the sidewalk where he stood, then dialed the airport. I'm trying to find my wife, Arpad asked politely to the airport personnel. He gave his wife's name and flight information. The airport personnel gave him a number to call. The Hungarian police. Arpad's heart ricocheted in his chest and his hands shook. I am Arpad Shu and I'm looking for my wife, Arpad began when he reached the number. Can you tell me what happened to her? Is she okay? We have been waiting for you to call, the voice said. Yes, she's okay. She's just sick. She got too sick to get on the plane. You will need to come pick her up. Dear God, Arpad prayed, realizing exactly what was going on. What have I done? She had been arrested with the fake visa in her passport, identified, and now she was bait to catch him. Let me talk to her, he said. I have to talk to her. I'm sorry. We can't let you do that, the voice continued smoothly. Where are you now? Give us the address, and we will come and get you and bring you to your wife. Then we can get everything taken care of. Arpad gave them a fictitious address. Posta Utka Tu, and the name of Niri Gehaza, a town some distance away. Can I talk to her for just a second? That's not possible. Can I take a message? Tell my wife I'm sorry, Harper said, tears coming into his eyes 
and burning them. Tell her, I'm so sorry. He hung up the phone as guilt rolled over him, crushing him. He smashed his palm into the metal sides of the telephone stand and wept. Iron gray clouds loomed in the sky to the north. The red tinge from the sun faded in the clouds to the west, leaving the day dead and cold around him. He looked around at the deserted streets and shivered. He felt a crushing weight in his heart. The police would be coming soon to find this phone where they would eventually trace him, and he must be gone. He knew what he had to do. The end of chapter 10 of In His Hand.